All right, welcome everybody to the weekly CITP Lunch Forum. Um, it's my privilege today to introduce our speaker, Adam Sedgwick. Adam is, uh, first of all, a, a graduate of our fine university. Um, he has, um, he's currently at uh, NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, as uh, a senior advisor on information technology policy. We love that phrase, information technology policy. Um, and, um, uh, and in that role is, um, uh, uh, plays an important role within the Commerce Department in setting um, policy on issues like cybersecurity. One of the things I learned in working with government is that as a policy issue, cybersecurity is uh, really hard. Um, many things are against you um, working on that problem. Um, the good news is that there are lots of really smart and thoughtful people in the government working on the issue, and, and Adam is certainly among them. We're very lucky to have him here today. Um, as I said, he's currently at NIST. Uh, he did a stint um, as um, a policy uh, advisor at the Federal CIO Council, um, and uh, before that he spent uh, a number of years um, on the staff of the Senate Homeland Security Committee and working with Senator Lieberman. Um, you also, uh, many of you know about the um, NIST solicitation, um, public solicitation for comments related to cybersecurity, um, which um, some of us are going to be preparing a response to. Um, and Adam is the point of contact at NIST for that uh, as well. So we're eager to hear what he has to say. Welcome Thanks, Ed. I'm glad, uh, I'm glad folks are aware of the RFI. Basically what I've been doing since it was released is going around and begging people to respond to it. So I'm uh, looking forward to reading your response. Um, so thanks for having me. Uh, Steve and I have actually talked about doing this for a couple of years now. Uh, we worked uh, on the Hill. We worked together on the PACER issues and um, some of the transparency things, which we can also delve into later if people are interested. Um, so I thought I'd talk kind of generally about cybersecurity policy in the federal government, but really drill down on the executive order, what's in it, what it means, what we think the path forward is, and what, what we hope the impact is going to be. Um, and if folks have questions, if I'm using too many acronyms or um, using Washington speak, please interrupt me and, and I can do my best to uh, explain on occasion I may not actually know what the acronym stands for. Um, well, tell us about the, the background of the executive sure. order, how it came to be. Yeah, I'll start with that. So I thought I'd start with what the president actually said when he signed the executive order, which was included in the State of the Union. Um, his statement at that point was, America must face the rapidly growing threat from cyber attacks. We know hackers steal people's identities and infiltrate private email. We know foreign countries and companies swipe our corporate secrets. Now our enemies are also seeking the ability to sabotage our power grid, our financial institutions, and our air traffic control systems. We cannot look back years from now and wonder why we did nothing in the face of real threats to our security and our economy. That's why earlier today I signed a new executive order that will strengthen our cyber defenses by increasing information sharing and developing standards to protect our national security, our jobs, and our privacy. Now Congress must act as well by passing legislation to give our government a greater capacity to secure our networks and, and deter attacks. So that was the framing he gave when he signed the executive order the same day of the State of the Union. Um, I could probably point to a number of other things and other, other government officials or, and also folks in industry talking about the nature of the threat, why government's getting increasingly concerned. The thing I wanted to point to in the president's statement is that the focus really of the executive order in this particular work is on protecting critical infrastructure from cybersecurity attacks. And so um, critical infrastructure is a, is a sort of a government term. It actually has two different definitions from the post 9-11 world, one from the Patriot Act and one from the Homeland Security Act. But it basically means those systems and assets, virtual or physical, that our country relies upon. Um, basically, yeah. I mean, I could pull the definition out, but no, no, no. at a broad term, that's what it is, right? Yeah, but the way you talk about it, at least from a cyber angle, is what are the things that would actually have a real damage to our national and economic security? Not just things that would be sort of unfortunate or bad or would make people unhappy, but what's the thing that would actually have a measurable impact? Um, now, uh, so to talk about the executive order, there's, you can really think about it as two main pieces. One's that piece that the president mentioned on information sharing. And the second piece is on 
the framework itself, what we're calling the cybersecurity framework, which is where NIST is involved and where I'll probably spend the most of my time today. Um, on the information sharing side, what the, what the executive order tries to do is expand government to industry in sharing of information. So that is government has good threat information. They're trying to figure out ways to share it out to industry in ways that don't compromise sources and methods. Um, occasionally industry, so occasionally industry feels like there's information they're not getting that they could use to better protect their systems. A lot of this debate we're seeing on the House side with CISPA um, and, and other similar bills, which is the cyber information <laughs> share, yeah, something, something like that. that. Yeah. Um, but I think that this, yeah, the distinction with what with the executive order and what the legislation is trying to do is the um, the executive order and, and all executive orders. You can't actually you, you're not actually rewriting the laws. You're just sort of implementing things within the contours of the laws that are already out there. So you couldn't create a new regulatory authority in an executive order. You can only interpret what the law already is. On occasion. The courts may feel like an executive order may interpret the law in a way that's not consistent with the intent of the law. When I was on the Hill, one of the issues we worked on was how an executive order impacted the Presidential Records Act and, and uh, the sharing of the, the declassification or the, the sharing of information after a president's term is over. Um, so. For, on the information sharing provisions, really the goal are figuring out better ways to, to get government information to industry. There are a lot of other questions, there are a lot of other policy debates about what about sharing information from industry to government and what about sharing information from industry to industry. You get into all sorts of privacy issues, all sorts of uh, trade issues, all sorts of liability issues when you start having those discussions. So yeah. One thing I noticed in, in uh, either reading the executive order or if it was in the uh, request for comments was um, the fact that they started talking about having a person at, you know, a company or whatever get a security clearance so that they could, you know, receive this information. And what size businesses do you, or what kind of businesses do you expect this to apply to? Uh, and I think specific in the context of, you know, higher education, you know, we have a obviously a very large network right. and we're interested in making sure it's secure but at the same time there might be overarching policies at the university that no we don't do anything that's classified so yeah I would be surprised if it went down to the level of universities okay I think with the intent of the I think it would be sort of the larger defense industrial base okay. utilities that's the goal of the executive order now certainly there are other ways there are other steps to share information more generally um, declassified information. I mean, that's one of been, that's actually been one of the challenges historically about dealing with this issue. The some of the the information that could really get people to act is classified at such a level that you can't actually tell people what's going on. Um, and I actually think we've seen a lot of progress in the five or six years that I've worked on this issue that we're actually able to have these conversations a little more. Um, and and you do see people sort of pushing out better information about what's going on. Um, but that's really the focus. I think on the, but the security clearance is an issue that comes up again and again. Even within the federal government a couple of years ago, the chief information officers, the folks I, I used to work with, some of them didn't have security clearances. So they're in government running major departments and agencies and they didn't have security clearance. I mean, that thankfully is a problem that has been fixed. Um, but I think there was a commitment in the executive order that more people should have security clearances to get that threat information. And, and for the, these big companies, it also then poses a, an additional requirement because if the person who would be the natural person in charge of this, you know, is working with a green card or something, and it's just right, you know, and what do you do with that information once you get it? Yeah, right. Yeah. A lot of folks don't like having security clearances because it actually limits your ability to talk about what's going on. So. Like within NIST, which is a scientific institution, very few of us have security clearances because you want to have the ability to do research without thinking, oh, is that something I learned in a classified arena? Um, it's hard to kind of segment your brain that way often times. You know, when I was on the Hill, we actually, 
the way we handled it is I didn't have a security clearance and someone else in the, the office did. So if she heard it from me, she knew that she didn't learn it, she didn't hear from it in a classified arena, and it made it easier for us to, to brief our boss about what he could say publicly. Um, is it even on the radar of the idea that when citizens without security clearances discover security flaws and do what might normally be considered sort of misdemeanor scribbling, they get put away in prison for three or four years, that this will somehow shut down certain kinds of useful discussions? Is that even register in policies? So what, give me a better example of so if someone learns something oh, well, in a classified setting and then they prosecutions, right? Um, right. Mr. AT and T hacker, I forget. Weave. Weave. I'm not. Yeah. Right. So um, there is a concern uh, that some people have that the um, what do we call the over criminalization? Of, yes. Uh, investigation of sort of right. security problems will lead to shutting down the kind of discussion of security problems that oh, went on 10 years ago at Princeton University where certain professors and their students discovered uh, problems in things and felt that they could not only notify the company that discussed the company, but remind the companies that they could go public too. Yeah. And some of this goes to computer fraud abuse acts. Right. right. So I know there's a, yeah, I mean. So there are policy goals that you came to talk about where the, the government would like to improve security by sharing information with right. the industry. Um, but there's other ways that, other places that information can come through that would also improve security. Yes. And uh, so my question is, in policy discussions uh, that participate in and you see people participating in that lead to um, these requests for comments and right. CISPA and executive orders. Does this concept even come through? Yeah, all the, I think all the time. Okay. I mean, that's why the request for comment is, is the way that it is. Because okay. um, from our processes, everything has to be open and shareable and transparent. Well, right. and, and I guess there's a, especially when you talked about the situation where you had a colleague at the clearance where you didn't and you talked to the boss. I mean, Wikipedia is full of things that are classified, right. but they're not marked as classified. Right. Nobody can confirm or deny that they're classified. Yeah. But if you had a piece of information that you knew about and you told your boss and they told somebody, it still could be classified. Oh, yeah. Some of the stuff from the Washington Post is still classified. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, I guess. No, I'd agree. It's a, it's a, it's, it's, a it's tricky. It's, it's tricky. It's a complicated issue. That's actually not what I'm here to talk about. This is kind of an aside. But those things, I mean, but I, I do think they're important considerations. I mean, and I think some of the debate over CISPA and what the Hill's doing on the information sharing side goes to the heart of how do you build these, how do you build it so people do feel compelled to share information and don't feel like they'll be prosecuted, right? Or, or something else could happen. There are, there are other harms that you could see developing. So when you're talking about information sharing, one of the, one of the things you hear is um, it's unfair if the industry, if industry tells the government something and then, they've, they, then, they've, then, it, then it gets handed over to the FTC or a regulator and they get hit for it when they were trying to provide information that would have benefited other companies, right? But the flip side of that is if you create the liability provision so broad, then the minute a company gets hacked, they'll run to the government because then no one can sue them. So crafting these things carefully, and I actually think the Feinstein bill does a pretty good job of that, is very important, um, and it is part of the discussion. Um, and I will say one thing that I've been surprised about with, uh, um, with the executive order on the information sharing side is is that actually the, the, the response to the Privacy and Civil Liberties Group was overwhelmingly positive, which, because the, the fair information practice principles were built in. So when, when we're building these programs to share information, the fact that the administration chose to go to that degree and have those principles of minimization and transparency, that, that the eight things that I'm sure 
um, Egg can quote. Um, in that, which I can't, but I can't, um, the privacy and civil liberty groups felt, felt like the, that the program would really support their goals. Um, so that's sort of on the information sharing side. The, the other main part, and the part that I'm more here to talk about, is the, what the cybersecurity framework is and what the uh, RFI is. And, and I'm glad that at least some folks in the room are familiar with our request for information. Um, what the, what the framework is and what NIST is doing is it's basically, framework is a, is a term of art that NIST has used in other areas. We have frameworks for the smart grid, we have frameworks for health IT, we have frameworks for cloud computing. And, and basically what it is is it's not, a, it's not one particular standard, it's not one particular methodology, but it's basically a collection of standards, methodologies, procedures, processes, things that then industry can use to try to achieve a certain level of performance and system resiliency. Um, and the, the, the process that we're looking at that you can see in our request for information is to see what industry is already doing and where are the international standards that they're already using and then how can we build off that and push those practices out to businesses that are part of the critical infrastructure that aren't using these standards and if there are particular gaps or if there are particular barriers um, try and understand what those gaps and barriers are and then kind of directing our work that way. Um, so the reason why NIST was chosen for this, or we believe NIST was chosen, is because um, it sort of plays this unique role in the federal government. As, as I mentioned, we're part of the, the Commerce Department, um, but we really have no authority to do anything. Um, so that, that is actually what gets us to work with industry and academia. And they feel compelled to come to the table and work with us because they know we're not going to turn around and do something with it. So it's a very open, you know, transparent process that we have when we're developing these, these standards. And also, you know, the, the, the commitment that the U.S. government has is in all of these things, we don't develop government unique standards. We first, we have a whole, we have a series of laws and processes in place that we look to the international standards bodies already to see what standards are in existence for anything, um, you know, fire codes or, um, you know, uh, any sort of hoses, any, anything you can think of. <laughs> hoses, are, uh, the, the, the Baltimore fire is the example they give us in this orientation where uh, there, was a, there was a fire and they couldn't actually, fire departments came in and they couldn't actually hook up to the um, fire hydrants because there was no consistency on, um, from from city to city, so they came in and Baltimore burned because then firefighters were just sitting there, unable to link into the water system. Um, so that's <clears throat> so NIST in particular has already, already plays a pretty prominent role in cybersecurity, in uh, developing standards and guidelines under something called the Federal Information Security and Management Act. And so the role that NIST plays in that is, is creating standards and guidelines for um, all federal, all unclassified federal information systems. So um, NIST has to sort of, us and, and, and what we do there is sort of assess where the market is and make sure that the U.S. government, to the fullest extent possible, can rely on commercial off-the-shelf products. And so the standards that NIST develop, and guidelines that NIST develops under those processes I mean, we have to do it for a range of organizations from the, you know, Morris K. Udall Scholarship Fund, which is probably three or four people, to the Department of Treasury, unclassified systems of the Department of Defense. All of those organizations have to rely on the standards and guidelines when they're thinking about how, how to build their systems. And the way that NIST, <coughs> sorry, runs that process is basically to have an open process with industry where we, we pose certain questions. So some of the guidelines will range from um, routes of trust for mobile devices or um, key management to um, 853, which is basically our, our set of all, con our, our, it's kind of our encyclopedia of controls that you would take up and use to try to protect um, an entire network from an administrative level. So 
the, um, so we have some experience in this space, and uh, what that, and that, and that's kind of informing what we're doing under the executive order. But it's it's different to the extent that we don't see our role here as developing the standards and guidelines ourselves. Instead, we're reaching out to industry to um, see what standards and guidelines and practices, basically what what industry is already doing, um, and. Uh, it's going to be a real challenge because, as you can see under the framework, it's sort of like the challenge that we have for the federal information and in the federal information arena. The, the, the executive order and the RFI has the assumption that there are certain concepts with cybersecurity that will apply regardless of what you're, of the sector, so if it's water, electric, um, government facilities, and regardless of the of the of the size of the organization, that in some ways there are there are core principles that we can lift up and say we think that these things these things could make a baseline framework that any organization could pick up and think about cybersecurity in a different way. Are you saying any government organization? No. Any organization. Any organization. Um, and. But by doing it in, th in this manner, by looking at what, what, what industry is already out there and as industry has already adopted, we think that this approach is fundamentally flexible and fundamentally scalable. Instead of waiting for the government to update its framework or its particular standard, you're pushing it out to the international standards bodies like IETF or ISO. Um, I don't know what those acronyms stand for. <laughs> um, that are doing this, that, that businesses have already come together and worked through these groups for their own benefit um, to, to talk about these technical issues in a particular way. Um, so I, I think you'll probably see, what you'll see is, us do is, is, as you see in the RFI, we're kind of pinging across sector, across academia, and trying to get a, basically a state of the market both in what, what technological solutions are out there, what standards and guidelines are out there, and what sectors are more advanced than others, and thinking about cybersecurity per their sectors. I think we have the expectation that in some sectors, particular regu particularly regula heavily regulator ones, regulated ones, they have robust sets of standards and considerations on how to protect their systems and think about cybersecurity. We think in some of the unregulated ones, they haven't really come together to think about it and they might not speak in the same language that those more advanced sectors do. So I think one hope of this process will be to allow us to even have common terminologies across those different sectors so they can at least talk about these concepts and talk about cybersecurity in the same way. Um, so I think some folks are familiar with the request for information. So let me, let me talk a little bit about what, what our process is and, and how that looks. Um, and how we'll actually, we're trying to tackle this problem. The RFI is, or the request for information is sort of our initial volley. It's kind of in this effort to present, we think that these are the considerations that need to go into developing this framework in eight months as the President's directed us. Um, the RFI basically has, has three main pieces. It has a piece on um, where we ask, how organizations think about cybersecurity risk, how they manage it, the issues around that. Then we have a section about um, what international standards are already out there and where are the potential gaps. So we're asking people to provide us, uh, or, and best practices, it's more than standards, other frameworks. So we're asking, uh, agent, we're asking organizations to, to say what they're already using and where they feel the gaps are if they aren't using these particular things and why not. Um, and then the third piece is sort of core practices that we think that, are, again, are our initial assumptions of things that can apply across industries. We think that probably every company needs to think about authentication. They probably at least need to consider encryption and key management. Um, so those sorts of concepts, and then we're asking, if you are using these things, what are the technologies that, that support them or the standards and guidelines? Um, so that's our kind of our initial, that's sort of how we're beginning this conversation with industry and with our partners across government. Um, once we get those comments in, and I, I think it's like um, people's thesis, they won't actually submit their comments until the very last day. 
<laughs> so we'll, we'll, we don't know if we're getting uh, 10 or 100 or 1,000, but I... Public yes, the comments will be so public. Are you concerned that individual companies won't want to sort of explain exactly where they're backward and where they're on top of things just because they would be afraid of security risks thereby? I think that might, that's, that's, a, that's a, a small concern, but um, overall, having the, tra well, first of all, we think that the practices will not get to that level of detail. So it won't be how you uh, manage your passwords, it'll be, but yes, we think about that. It won't be, it won't be here's the combination to the door, but yes, we do have a lock on that door. Um, and I think the other, but the other piece of it and the reason why we're, we're doing it this way is because we want all of this to be, we, you know, we see this kind of as industry's document, right? What NIST is doing is providing some sort of, the convening authority, providing some level of technical expertise, but it needs to be something that industry can take up and use. So if they don't feel compelled telling us these things, then I don't know how we can make it, we can put it in the final framework and tell other companies why this is an important thing. So I think the other pieces of it, you know, maybe the threat, the, the sharing of threat information and building those relationships can get those challenges. But what we want to be able to do is at the end of the, at the, end of the day when we make these decisions, or when industry makes these decisions, there's, there's some level of traceability. Um, and we think that also with, on the threat space too. Um, when we sort of have these, when we have these events, we're going to try to ask we're going to ask industry how they see the threat space and, what, and, what, and what, what they're concerned about there instead of government just providing it themselves. Um, so once we have the RFI out there, we're going to have a series, you know, NIST sort of operates in workshops. Our first workshop is uh, April 3rd at the, at the Commerce Department. Um, and that's, that's again kind of turning to industry asking what are the things that they would need in this document what are their expectations under the executive order? And also, what are the things they don't need or they don't want to see? What, what, what would lead them not to adopt this or, or look to this? Um, and one of the things we're doing is talking about the threat. We're having, um, we're looking to have a panel of ISACs, Information Sharing Advisory Councils. So that's something that comes out from the Department of Homeland Security where the sectors are basically self-organized to share threat information. Um, after that, after we have that initial workshop, I think we'll probably, you know, the, the responses are doing the eighth, and then, you know, we'll analyze the ten, a hundred, or a thousand responses, and then kind of look where there are synergies, do some initial analysis of where the various sectors are, and then kind of constantly be presenting that information back out and asking folks to comment and, and give us what their considerations are over what's important and what's not. Um, what we'll do then is probably have a series of workshops throughout the country where we ask industry to come in and actually um, do the work themselves and present these things out, probably come back to the same topics again and again and again and try to have those arguments and those discussions to see where we can really find consensus. Um, organizations will have very, very different needs. If you're a very small, small business, you probably just want to be told pretty close to exactly what to do if you're, you know, a, a huge, if you're Boeing or Northrop Grumman, maybe you don't need that information quite as much. You probably have pretty robust processes and um, information. Um, so we'll probably have three or four workshops throughout the country, and then we'll be sort of constantly coming back and reporting this out and saying, does this sound right to you? Um, and then, you know, in October, we'll have something that looks like a draft RFI, a draft framework. Um, and then we'll have four months to work to, to then go back and work with our agency partners who have the more direct relationship with the various sectors and make sure it's things that they think can tie to their sector needs as well. Um, I mean, the way that the director of NIST talks about this process is it's sort of like a, either a sandwich or an Oreo cookie, where, where right now, we work with our interagency partners really clo closely to, to sort of develop the scope. We have the RFI out, we're getting information. And then NIST kind of goes out and works with industry to really test out the market. And then we sort of come back together to, to see what we've developed and then work, work on the implementation side. Um, and I think once that, 
you know, draft document is out, I think some of the some of the discussions we'll probably have at the end of the day is how does this process become how do we manage this in future years? Is this something that the government should continue to play a role in, or is there a way we could actually move this whole thing out to industry and let them lead it through a standards body or in another mechanism? Uh, that's something we consider a lot in our work under federal for federal information security. While we develop these things to the fullest extent possible, we then try to, to roll them out because it's better for us to, it's a, it's a religion at NIST to kind of move those things out because they know that that's something that can scale globally and can lead to truly interoperable cybersecurity products. So I'll leave it there if folks have additional questions or other things they want to talk about. So I, th I think there's a strong feeling in the security community that standards are not necessarily helpful because they lead to a, a security mentality that involves sort of checklisting. Right. Right. And and how do you I mean I presume that the first order approximation from people who know what they're doing in industry is this process is useless because standards I do are it. useless. Right, or they say I, I already know what I'm doing, I don't need to follow this right. checklist. So NIST NIST is in that debate pretty often. Um, and uh, it's an interesting it's an interesting discussion. So if you look at the two words that describe the framework in the executive order, the, the first word is prioritized and, the, and the, the second word is flexible. And what those mean in particular standards, I think, are an interesting way to talk about it. So the NIST process is we have something called 853, which is a set of the 300 controls of things you should do to, to protect your system. And then we have a methodology by which you can select those controls. So it's actually not supposed to be a check the box. It's supposed to be a way to think about risk and risk management and then using the tools that are out there. Now, often it does lead to a check the box mentality. I mean, that's the problem we have on the, on the federal information side. Um, but I actually don't think that's a unique problem in security. Um, you know, my brother works in international development and he always talks about if you're getting money out for grants, how do you track that? And then often um, you spend more time writing the reports to show that you're spending money on the grants than actually doing the work that the grant was trying to achieve. So some of the work NIST has done on um, continuous monitoring and um, is trying to get away from that sense of you're just kind of checking the box and moving up. But I, I think that's that's, those are sorts of the sort of things we're posing to industry as well, or at least we're trying to. I guess the real question is, how do you get buy-in from industry, given that this is a problem? How do you avoid the adverse selection process in which everybody who is, does know what they're doing and who feels strongly that they know what they're doing and feels strongly that the standards process is useless, um, how do you get them to show up and sort of tell you what the best practices are so that if you do end up with some people following checklists, at least the checklists are, are good checklists. So, I mean, who, you're not just left with, with people who don't know what they're doing or who don't know what the best practices are. Well, I think what's, that's, what, that's what the RFI is trying to get at, right? You're trying to say, if the standards aren't working, why, why, we're trying to ask those questions as well. If you think standards lead to sort of a check-the-box compliance mentality, then, then what are other practices that we can do? I mean, it's not just standards. It goes, I think it goes beyond that because we're asking questions about how organizations manage risk. Um, I think that standards often can sort of describe what people are already doing um, and give kind of additional guidance at a high level rather than always leading to sort of a check-the-box compliance. Because standards are, I mean, standards are also just ways, common ways of speaking and measuring across industry. It's not just a do these particular things. I mean, I think you're talking about more specifically like a performance standard. We're talking more broadly than that and kind of the standards that allow for interoperability and products to be built together. Let me address that one as well based on my experience in a small government agency. Um, one of the things that these sorts of standards do is they help the people who want to do security right convince management that it's worth spending money and people on addressing a particular issue, right? So when budget time comes or some decision-making time comes and there's some security thing that you want to do and want to do right, 
and you have people in house who know how to do it, but there's a decision that needs to be made. Are we as an organization going to do this thing or are we going to do some other valuable thing that's also valuable to the organization outside of the security field? Being able to point to a standard like this and saying, look, the, you know, the standard from NIST about what, you're, about what a good agency is supposed to do, which is well respected within the government, says we should be doing this. Uh, that's another piece of evidence that you can pile up and hopefully influence the decision. Yeah, so I mean, if you know yeah. what you want to do, um, it, it's easier to do it with this thing in place than if it's not. Yeah, and I think the goal is to a, a kind of achieve that common baseline so that then you can innovate on top of that and to try to help with sort of the common language so across sectors and across industry you can communicate. You, you talked a little bit about, um, or you alluded to talking about the threat model, but you talked about um, you know, companies want to do authentication and, and you know, worry about you know, certificates and that sort of thing. Um, is this mostly about um, you know, a company protecting itself from attacks from the outside? Or how does this play into the arena of it's in the best interest of everybody if everybody is, you know, has their machines secure, like uh, you know the home users or whatever, right. so that they're not part of botnets, which, yeah, the multi kind of the general multi-stakeholder problem. Yeah. yeah. So, so I just I just wondered um, how how that might fit in because I I can see a, a path where um, we're more know, large ISP. On. Yeah. does something that says this is good for everybody, but now none of the customers are happy because they can't do things that they used to be able to do. Yeah, and I think that's, well, so I think we're, we're just posing questions about cybersecurity risk generally. So that could include insider threat, that could include outside attacks. And then we ask a lot of questions about, I mean, we don't, we, the, the RFI is not, is trying to kind of look at a real world environment. So it's not trying to say, so it's trying to say kind of what are your business needs, what are your business drivers. What are, the, what are the things that limit you from doing the things that you think you should be doing? Because there are going to be some real challenges to implementing some of these things, and we want to be very cognizant of that. And what are the costs, things like that. Um, so I think it is important to think of it from kind of that, that, more, that more broad perspective, but also being aware of the particular threat. But the threat's going to evolve as well. Is there a path, or does this happen very often, where like a NIST standard or something that says this is a great guideline, then becomes so, so it turns into law in, in part or in whole? You know, everybody needs to follow this. Yes, that does happen, and it's a challenge. I mean, and, and what's interesting about what the, the NIST process is, um, it tries to be by having the distance from. Um, so it, having the distance from law, it allows us to work with the real technical people instead of just the policy folks. That makes sense. Is it envisioned that sort of some sort of certification or some uh, yeah, uh, component will be part of these guidelines? Or some, if you take it out of the government, some commercial will be some? Can you get a stamp that you sort of follow the camp guidelines? Or? So we ask some questions in the, or we, I think, we might ask a question, but we talk a little bit about, about conformity assessment is, is what the NIST folks call that, right? It's one thing to do a standard. It's another thing to actually prove that you're following a standard. So I think we're looking at sort of tools that can be used to show conformance, but I don't think it's envisioned at this point that this would turn into anything like a certification. Existing standards within the federal government, like BISMA, will have significant impact on this process? I think it's likely that we'll see a lot of organizations that say that they follow NIST standards voluntarily. Right. Right, and that's, that's what we see a lot. I mean, because NIST has to do it, so it's out there, and they're, they're freely available. Um, so organizations often choose to follow them. So I think we will see that. Uh, but we might see them, you know, pointing to NIST standards and then complaining about them as well. <laughs> that's sort of not up to us. It'll be what's in the, and that I mean, and that, but that's part of the process. That and then that will inform kind of how we up, how, how we update those standards. Are there are there any? Oh, go ahead, you have a question. Uh, are there any of the questions that you think are? <coughs> 
particularly difficult or that you're particularly concerned about getting feedback on? Or concerned about not getting feedback on? Or alternatively, yeah. questions that you think um, academics would be particularly yes. helpful on? Yeah. I'll have to look through them. I mean, uh, one of the challenges we had in putting that together is making sure that the questions were broad enough that it covered um, academics and industry and then security experts. So a lot of people have said, do I really have to respond to every single question? <laughs> um, and the response is, of course, no, because we had to, we had to, go, in, we had to go in with that. Um, so I think, uh, I, I would think kind of the questions more towards the end would be something that would be more in your interest and kind of the, the more particular practices and what the challenges are in implementing some of those things. standards for security or just defense in general, is there, is there any sort of like monoculture risk where you really clarify things for a would-be attacker if everybody is defending themselves in the same way? Or is the advice here, the standards, are they general enough that that really wouldn't be an issue? I think that's something they consider and often the way that the standards are to develop to allow that level of flexibility to evolve with the, with the bad guys, right, to, so that you're, you, you can sort of a lot of it is, and there are, there, are, there are management controls that are often a piece of this. So it's not just about, you know, configure your system in this way. It's sort of like the considerations that you should take in when you are configuring a system. Um, like the whole, what we call the risk management framework. When you think about how to select the things that you're going to do and how you have that evolve based on the risk that your organization has. Structured. Who in these organizations are making these decisions, right? Because you've got the tech people, yeah. you've got management people. Uh, so that's an increasing, yeah. From? That's an increasing challenge, right? And that's that's what that's where this why this debate has gone has become. That's an interesting path that this debate has gone in, right? I mean, some of the things that the folks in the White House say a lot uh, is. Uh, it's increasingly moving into the boardroom, and it's increasingly moving into the CEO. I've even seen that here in the, in the yeah. sense that uh, you know, a rule that relates to IT security or policy comes down from above, and we're like, where did this come yeah. from? And they're yeah. like, oh, well, the board of directors said this yes. was a good idea because they heard, yes. you know, they read in the news, and they don't want us to be in the newspaper for this particular kind of threat, so yes. let's do this. And, yes. and it, ha it happens. Yeah, and so I think, and so I think companies are sort of evolving to deal with that, and really trying to think about what is the information that I need to present to my CEO. Right. And you know, a CEO might want to hear something from their CISO. Okay, if I give you forty million dollars to do this, can you promise me that I can't be hacked? And the answer is usually going to be, well, no. <laughs> <laughs> but but I can promise that if we meet all the guidelines, we we won't be fired for not meeting the guidelines. Right. <laughs> right. So I think that's going to be an important consideration for this or sort of any of the work in the future. And that's kind of, you know, um, in some ways that's sort of where IT and policy will increasingly meet. And to figure out ways to communicate to non-technical folks um, the things you need to do in the security arena is going to really be increasingly important. And, I, we, and you know, you, you do hear things about how organizations sort of manage these things differently. In some places, you'll have an information security officer that reports to the chief information officer that reports to the CEO. In other places, you might just have a chief security officer that thinks about physical security as well as for, you know, IT security, and that might be a completely separate report to the CEO and to the board. Um, but you know, this is a challenge we see, again, in, in the federal information security space all the time. The, the person who basically is responsible for the information um, and the information security of their organization is the head of the agency. It's the person who's in the president's cabinet. So, so they're the ones that have to really be aware of what's going on in their networks. And the sort of supporting IT staff has to think about how to communicate what's going on in a way that makes sense to them, that allows them to make decisions. Um, so I'm hoping we'll get some good information from the RFI on that topic precisely. Uh, uh, along similar lines, uh, 
what kind of um, an effort is there to ensure that you get a kind of broad representation, you know, not just from like big vendors, but I can imagine big vendors spending the, you know, the, the resources yeah. to actually make a response, but maybe not some small ones. So part of that's what we've been doing over the last six weeks since the RFI came out. We've been trying to, I mean, it's admittedly the Washington group. We've been trying to go around and, and making sure that we have representation from the different sectors. I think the next thing we'll do is, is uh, once we get the responses to the RFI, really try to do a good analysis to see where the responses are coming in and making sure that we, it's not just big companies in particular sectors, but we have a pretty broad representation of um, companies of all sizes and all sectors. And then we can sort of, um, you know, adjust our plan accordingly when we're doing these additional events throughout the country. Okay, our, our time is up. Uh, so let's turn to um, informal conversation. Um, those who, uh, who want to continue conversation with Adam, stick around. Those who need to go somewhere, you're welcome to go. Thanks very much. Yeah, yeah thanks, thanks.